speaker of this session is uh, Professor Yuri Silvestre from Argentina. He's a professor in Chicago after working for his thesis in Texas. And he's going to be talking about the regularity estimates for parabolic integral differential equations and applications. And the title conceals a bit uh, the novelty of what they are doing. Looks like uh, all that normal stuff. It is very normal. So. All right, thank you very much. I have to get used to the microphone. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is about this uh, inter-differential equations, about non-local equations. Uh, my objective is to... Uh, is there a fire alarm or something? <laughs> So my objective is to explain what the equations are. Uh, no, my, I didn't do anything. So anyway, that's not too loud. Um, so my objective is to show you what the equations are, uh, try to show you what, what we can prove about them, and uh, I'm, I also want to show you some applications of these type of equations, so you know what they are used for. Um, so the equations are, the equations I want to talk about are um, behave similarly as elliptic and parabolic equations um, in the sense that they satisfy maximum principles and they have some regularization properties. You know that an elliptic equation is something that is similar to the Laplace equation and uh, parabolic equations are the ones that are similar to the heat equation. So uh, I want to start from the very beginning, so I'm going to start from the definition of the Laplacian. I cannot start from earlier than that. So you know that the Laplacian is, well, you, of course you can define it as a, that is sum of the second derivatives in all directions. That's kind of an, an obscure definition because you know, it depends on the coordinates and so on. Uh, you can also define the Laplacian as the divergence of the gradient. <coughs> if you know how to interpret these two operators, that's an okay definition. Uh, but I want to give you, to, to, to start with a, with a slightly different point of view that is, if I take a function and I take an average of the function in a ball of radius r, center of the point x, then you can make an expansion of this average in terms of r. So the first term is, of course, the value of the function in the center. And the second term is quadratic in r. And the coefficient of this term is what the Laplacian of the function is. And this, you can say this is the definition of the Laplacian. Uh, if I rearrange the terms, this tells me that the Laplacian of the function is this limit as r goes to 0 of this average of incremental portions of the function in all directions starting from x. Um, and in fact, uh, you can also recall the Laplacian if instead of taking the average of these incremental quotients in a ball, you weight that average by an arbitrary function j that is radially symmetric. So if you take any positive radially symmetric function j, when you take this limit, you're going to end up with a, a constant multiple of the Laplacian. Um, in fact, if you, if, you, if, you, if you drop the radial symmetry condition on j, and you just take a function j that is symmetric in the sense of j of y is the same of j of negative y, what you will end up with is a total Laplacian with a uh, second order elliptic operator. So it's a positive matrix times the Hessian of the function. So it's funny that when you, when you take this limit as r goes to zero, you lose some complexity in the type of objects that you study because I start with an arbitrary function of whatever symmetric function, and you end up with the Laplacian or uh, a positive matrix, that's all the choices that you can, that you can have after you take that limit. <coughs> so the heat equation, of course, is you can rewrite it like this, because this is what the Laplacian is. And if you think of the heat equation like this, then you see that, uh, sorry, what you see is that the heat equation, what it's doing is infinitesimally, it's, it's taking the value of a function at one point, and it's pushing the, the value towards the average of the values in an infinitesimal neighborhood of that point. So if you think about the equation that, that way, that it's trying to make all the values match the aver average of the values around. And it's more or less, uh, it's, it makes some sense that the equation has some regularization effect. Um, so of course, uh, you know, we all know the heat equation very well. We, you, we know that it has a unique solutions. You know that we know that it satisfies the maximum principle that it regularizes the initial data. So when, what, what, one thing that one can wonder is uh, if, if these properties are exclusive of second order uh, parabolic equations or they're, they're actually 
something that, that is true for, for all these interdifferential differential equations for which the equations are the limits as r goes to 0. So the type of equation that I want to study is the non-infinitesimal version of the heat equation or of parabolic equation. So here we, take a, we have an, a, a kernel function k. <coughs> there are many choices for this k for which the operator makes sense. And we will study an equation like this. So if I'm going to take k to be a positive function, which is what we need for the equation to satisfy the maximum principle. You see that if you take the, 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 the value of x for which u achieves its maximum, then all these incremental quotients are negative. So the derivative of u at that point respect to time is going to be negative. So that means that the maximum is always pushed down by the equation in the same way that the minimum will be pushed up. And that's what's, what, what gives us the maximum principle for this type of equation. Um, the, the type of kernel scale for which the operator makes sense has to satisfy this integrability condition that is. Um, so I want the operator to make sense at least when u is a smooth function, meaning that it's a bounded function at infinity and it has some regularity, let's say smooth, so C2 around uh, at all points. So for this operator to make sense, I would need, need k to be integrable. But since I have this cancellation for small values of y, for small values of y, we can relax the integrability condition that k times y squared is integrable. Well, the way I wrote the, the, the operator up there is not quite y squared. It will be y to the power 1. In order to have y squared, I, I need to subtract the first order part of the function times the characteristic of a ball. Um, in many cases, I'm going to be taking the assumption that k is a symmetric function, meaning that k of y is the same as k of negative y, in which case I'm sub subtracting an odd function, which has integral 0, at least in the principal value sense. Um, so what about, are the equations like this going to have regu regularization properties? Are they going to regularize the initial data? So this is going to happen if, the, if my operators have some scaling properties, meaning that when I go, when I rescale the equation and I go to smaller and smaller scales, some sort of, some form of the equation has to survive, right? So there, there has to be some assumption on K that, that tells us that we still have an equation in the smaller scales. <coughs> So this is, a, this is a particular case when k is a power of y that is a very well-known operator. That is the fraction of Laplacian. If you take the, the fraction of Laplacian of u when s is a parameter strictly between 0 and 1, it has exact, it's exactly this formula. So it's, uh, it's well, the negative of the previous uh, the formula in the previous slide with the power of y. There is a con renormalization constant there that I forgot to write. Um, so this is the operator that if you look at, if you, if you look at this operator in Fourier side, it would be mal like multiplying times the, the Fourier transform of u times psi to the power 2s. When s is equal to 1, the Laplacian is multiplying times psi squared. When s is in between 0 and 1, the fraction of Laplacian is multiplying times the corresponding power of psi. Um, so you see that here, the kernel that we're taking is a not an integral function at the origin, so it's integrable when you multiply times y squared at the origin. Um, in this case, it's also a, a symmetric function, so I can skip the, <coughs> the first order correction. And the, the integral makes sense classically if s is less than 1 half and u is a smooth function. And otherwise, it makes sense in the principal value sense, or you would have to add the first order correction. Um, so you see that the fractional Laplacian is an operator of order 2s, right? So these are operators of fractional order. The, the order of the operators I'm going to talk about today is always in between 0 and 2. Um, and let me mention that the, the, the way the, the, the study of non-local equations started was from the study of uh, Levy processes. Levy processes are these uh, stochastic processes that have uh, uh, that are Markovian and have independent increments. And when you, when you study all the possible Levy processes, there is this theorem that says that all the generating function, the, the, the equation that if you, if you look at the distribution of the, uh, the probability distribution of a, of, 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 of a Levy process, when you look at, at, at how, how the particle evolves, 
the probability diffusion is, gonna, is, is going to evolve by this PD that has this, the first term that, that corresponds to the diffusion part of the process, the second term that <coughs> corresponds to the drift, and the third term that corresponds to the discontinuity of the process. So this kernel K represents a frequency of jumps of this stochastic process. So the stochastic process is going to be like a diffusion, but by time to time, it, it takes some jump. It has some discontinuity. When it jumps, it jumps from x to x plus y, right? So what the kernel k represents is the frequency of jumps from x to x, x plus y. If for the values of y that the kernel is larger, you're going to see those jumps more often than for the values of y where the kernel is smaller. Um, when you see an equation like this, uh, parabolic equations typically, when you study the regularization properties, you will focus on this term, which is kind of the Laplacian. So that regularizes the solution of the equation. So I want to not I, I want to study not the regularization property of this term, but the regularization property of that term. So uh, even if I, the best way to do that is to drop this term, you know, not to study equations that do not have a <coughs> second order diffusion, and see what regularization we can get from the integral part of the equation. <coughs> um, so up to now, I wrote only linear equations, but of course, I'm interested in nonlinear models that, that, have, that are also of, of integral differential structure. Um, so before I go into theorems for integral differential equations, let me recall what are the fundamental theorems uh, of fun for the study of regularity of nonlinear equations of second order. So when we study second order parabolic equations, there are two theorems that are like the, the fundamental theorems for the study of regularity properties of nonlinear equations. Um, there is a theorem of the George National Moser, which is a Heller estimate for solutions of parabolic equations in divergent form. So the assumption here is that these coefficients a i j are uniform elliptic, so they satisfy those two pointwise bounds. There is no assumption with respect to the regularity of these coefficients with respect to either x or t. And the theorem says that the Helder norm in a cylinder is uh, bounded by the L2 norm in a larger cylinder. Here, B1 half and B1 stands for the space, and the other interval is for with respect to time. Um, the theorem of Kirillov and Safono <coughs> is pretty much the same result, but now the equation is in non divergent form instead of an equation in divergent form. Um, so these, these theorems, in these theorems, it's very important that there is no regularity assumption on the coefficients, that only the pointwise bounds are assumed. Because these are theorems that are used to study the regularity of solutions to nonlinear equations. A nonlinear equation, well, it pretty much a nonlinear equation is like a linear equation, but whose coefficients depend on the solution itself, right? So if you, if you want to show that a solution to a nonlinear equation is uh, held in continuous or C1 alpha or whatever, um, you will think about it as a linear equation, but the, solution, but the coefficient depends on the solution itself. And you can never assume that these coefficients are smooth, because that would take you to a circular uh, reasoning. So you have to start with a quantitative information on the, on the coefficient, but without any smooth assumption of the coefficient, if you want to be able to as uh, apply this theorem to nonlinear equations. Um, so these are the two very important like, fundamental theorems for the regularity of second order parabolic equations. What I want to discuss is an, an analogs of these results for integral differential equations. Okay? So, in the same way as for second order equations, the theory for uh, the, the, re the corresponding results for integral differential equations in divergent <coughs> form appeared, at the, at the, appeared before. So, an analog of the George Nash Moser theorem would be that if you have an operator like this, uh, here the right hand side is really the Euler Lagrange, uh, is, the, is the derivative of this quadratic form. Um, so, an, an analog of the George Nash Moser theorem would be to have a Heather estimate for an equation like this, assuming some pointwise bounds on the kernel k, but without assuming any regularity for k with respect to x or y. And there is a family of results, there are several people and several papers about this subject. Um, why is there so many different results? Well, when we study inter-differential equations, of course, there is a 
much richer family of equations than when we study second order equations. When we study second order equations, we just have um, an n by n matrix at every point, right? And then we have to put conditions on that matrix. Here, at every point, we have this huge function, huge kernel, and there are many, uh, many options. There is uh, many degrees of freedom. So naturally, there is a, is a bigger variability in what type of theorems you're going to prove. Um, so what you need, essentially, if you want to have a Hilder estimate for an equation like this, is you need this <coughs> quadratic form to be comparable to a fractional Sobolev norm square, right? Um, so these are, are going to be equations. These are going to be operators that are going to be of a fractional order, of an order that's strictly between zero and two. Uh, if this is an s here, this is going to be the, the, this is going to be an operator of order two s. So what we are going to, what we need, if we want to come up with some analog of the Georgian Asmoser, essentially, is to have this quadratic form to be comparable to the uh, Sobolev norm square. Um, so one way what, that we can achieve that is if the kernel is comparable point-wise to x minus y to the negative n minus 2s. So if the kernel was exactly equal to that, then we would, be, we would have the fractional heat equation. So this will give us the fractional Laplacian on the right-hand side. If the fractional was exactly this, in fact, here we would have equality. This quadratic form would be exactly this, the Sobolev norm. So if, if the kernel is bounded by below and, up and above by a multiple of that, we will have a comparability of the quadratic forms. And <coughs> one can prove an analog of the Chochin Asmoser, meaning that the solution becomes Hilder continuous in positive time. <laughs> but this, 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 this assumption is actually something that can be relaxed quite a bit. So um, there is a. If, if we assume the upper bound, but for the lower bound, we only assume that the lower bound holds in some directions that have a positive density on the unit sphere, let's say, that's already enough to have this comparability. So, so that it is, shows that there are these this, this singular equations that also satisfy an analog of the church in Asmoser uh, result. And there is something very interesting that happens when, when we relax the assumptions to be um, for the lower bound to, to hold only in this uh, positive density cones, and is that we have the Helder estimates, but we do not have the Harnack inequality. So um, when we prove Helder estimates for second order equations, for parabolic equations, for elliptic equations, it's typically what you, prove, you, 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 you make a proof that you prove that they, they satisfy the Harnack inequality. And then from the Harnack inequality, you deduce the Helder continuity. In this case, the Helder continuity is true, but the Harnack inequality is false. There are counterexamples, right? So this is something funny that happens with this type of equation. What is true is the weak Harnack inequality. So let me clarify what I mean by those two properties. So Harnack inequality is we have a function which is a non-negative solution of some equation. And that, that the, the equation that satisfies the Harnack inequality means that if we take a, a cylinder, here horizontal means space, vertical means time then the infimum in a piece of a cylinder is controlled by the supremum in an earlier cylinder, earlier in time. Right? And the assumption that we have to make is that the, 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 the function is non-negative everywhere. You know that in, for the Harnack inequality, for the heat equation, let's say, you would take the function to be non-negative in the cylinder where the solution holds only. Here is a non-local equation. Things that are far outside of the domain affect what happens in the equation inside the domain. So we have to assume non-negativity of the solution everywhere. That's the, the only difference in the statement with respect to the uh, second order local case. Uh, the weak, what I call the weak Harnack inequality is that when, it, we, when we start with the super solution of the equation, and then the infimum is controlled by below by some average, uh, some average of the, some LP norm of u in, in, in this cylinder instead of the supremum. Um, so what I was saying is that it's easier to satisfy the weak Harnack inequality than it is to satisfy the Harnack, the full Harnack inequality. For, for the singular kernels, the weak Harnack inequality holds, but the, that, but the full Harnack inequality doesn't hold. Um, here, there is this power p that depends on the, on the type of equation. If we look at equations in divergence form, p is typically going to be equal to 2. 
If we look for equations in non-divergence form, for second order equations in non-divergence form, P is a very small number, it's smaller than one. And for inter-differential equations, you can always prove that the weak Hamming equation holds with P equal one. Uh, that's a funny thing, like, uh, if you take an inter-differential equation, let's say in non-divergence form, which I'm going to write in the next slide, uh, you can show this weak Hamming inequality for P equal one, uh, which is not true for second order equations, and the proof is rather simple. It's much simpler than the proof of the weak Hamming inequality for second order equations. So what is the catch? Because second order equations are like limit cases of inter-differential equations. The catch is that this constant C doesn't pass to the limit when you pass from inter-differential equations to second order equations. So if I put P equal 1 here, I can give you a very simple proof of this for inter-differential equations. But if you take the order of the equation converts to 2, then the constant C goes to 0. So you don't recover anything in the second order case. Uh, this is a proof that is, 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 is fairly simple. Like, like it means it's simpler than the one in the second order case. Somehow it takes advantage of the fact that the equation is not local. So even though the no local equation a priori looks like scary, a scary equation, it seems that it's going to be harder than the second order case, in some way it is easier. Because uh, the, the, easy, the short way to say it is that there is a very explicit way in which the different values of the function interact. Um, the proof of this thing can be deduced from several ideas in papers. It was never ex written explicitly anywhere, so I wrote it in the proceedings paper. Um, so now let me give you some uh, partial history of uh, results for equations in <coughs> inter-differential equations in non-divergence form. So an inter-differential equation in non-divergence form we have would have this form, so I have the time derivative to be uh, this uh, this average of, inter of of incremental quotients. So the way I think about it is that for every t and every x, I have a kernel with respect to y that gives me tells me tells me how I'm averaging the incremental quotients at that particular point, right? Uh, so the typical assumption would be that this this kernel with respect to y is comparable to the kernel of the fractional Laplacian, meaning that there is a constant. Uh, there, there are two constants that one is bounded, uh, uh, one bounds the kernel from above, the other one bounds the kernel from below. Um, so it's a typical assumption. Of course, there are more general assumptions for which you can prove it, but this is a good way to start. And if we take an assumption like this, we would be saying that the operator is of order alpha. This alpha is a number that is strictly between zero and two. So the, be the first result that was a, a Harnack inequality result and, uh, and, he and hold the held the estimates for elliptic equations um, was using probabilistic methods. So it was, since uh, these, o these operators come from Levy processes, uh, it, it naturally used that framework. So from probabilistic ideas, they came up with a proof of the Harnack inequality and the held the estimates. Um, so uh, the, the, I, this is a paper that I wrote when I was in grad school that, that, that gives an analytic proof of, of the Heller estimates. Uh, the, the, the proof here is <coughs> actually quite simple. This is, uh, this is also an elliptic, version, uh, an elliptic result. And because the, the, when you, it's just a, as a quick kind of inequality before, you can take advantage of the non-local form of the equation and it actually makes the proof simpler than if you compare the same type of results for second order equations. In second order equations, the proof of the proof of Krilov Safonov theorem is a fairly sophisticated proof. There is no way around that. Um, when you go to inter-differential equations, the, if, if you don't want the constant of, of, your, of your estimates to be uniform in the degree of the equation, you can get very simple proofs. Um, so, in the next paper that I did with Caffarelli, we came up with uh, a, a Harnack inequality and held the estimates with constants that are, in fact, independent of the degree of the equation. So from the result in this paper, you can recover the, the, the corresponding estimates for second order equations. And because of that, unavoidably, it is a much, much more difficult proof than the one in the previous paper. So then there were generalizations. Uh, Chang, uh, Lara, and Davila did like uh, parabolic version of our, of our result with Caffarelli. There is also a related result by Kim and Kim Lee. Kim Lee is around there somewhere. There. Um, <laughs> and this, uh, this last one over here that, uh, that I'm mentioning, these are two papers that they study singular kernels. So 
It's, a, it's an elliptic problem and where you have the upper bound for the kernels, meaning that the kernel is controlled by a path, by a, by a power of y, but from below it's only, com it's, only, it's only controlled by below in some special directions and not in every direction. So it's similar to what I was explaining in the um, Intel differential case. Um, and when you have that control from below only in certain directions, same as in the, in the divergence uh, type uh, equations, the Harnack inequality breaks. So you have the Helder continuity, you have weak Harnack inequality, but Harnack, the full Harnack inequality is not true. There is a, an explicit counterexample of that. Um, so the latest result that is actually some, some work that I have in preparation with Russell Schwab is like a, well, a generalization of the previous results, where instead of having the upper bound of k pointwise, the upper bound for the kernel is on average. So if, it's, if, if, we have k, if we had k bounded from above by the fractional Laplacian, it would imply this inequality. This is like what you get after you, inter after you integrate that bound. And the lower bound is what I was mentioning, is that at every point x and t, you have uh, some directions for which the, the lower bound holds. And then you know that the set of, this set of directions has some positive density. Um, so under these two assumptions, we can prove that the solutions, of the, the equation satisfies the weak Harnack inequality and the Helder estimate. So the Harnack inequality, the full Harnack inequality, does not does not hold in, for this type of assumptions. And let me mention the, the purpose, if you want, for proving this theorem. Um, so of course, it's a generalization of the previous results. It's ex it exhausts the ideas that we have for the for proving this type of results. So if you, if, you really want, if you want to generalize these two assumptions, you will need to come up with a new idea. But it also allows, it allows us to apply this type of results to get estimates for the space homogeneous Boltzmann equation. That's something I have in mind. Uh, so that's kind of like, a, if this is in preparation, the rest is the like future work. So if you take, if you take, if you take a, a kernel with this, with only these assumptions, and it has to be these assumptions. If you put the stronger assumptions, it, it wouldn't be good enough. You can take this and just apply it to space homogeneous Boltzmann equation, you get some estimates. Uh, that's something I'm going to mention at the end. That's why we want to prove something this general. That because if it's not this general, it wouldn't be good enough. <coughs> so anyway, um, now I'm, I smashed into this into this slide, a bunch of uh, applications to this type of equations. Um, let's see how much I can explain this. So the first one, Levy processes, is what I mentioned before. It's, it's really a group of applications, because Levy processes is a big subject. There are many models all over the place uh, in financial math. Here is a book about applying Levy processes to financial math. In physics, there is survey articles that have really like books about it. So there are many models that both linear and non-linear that employ Levy processes, and they give us integral differential equations. Um, so the first line is more like a big subject that has a lot of, that in, puts together a lot of different applications. So the other ones are maybe not that obvious. Um, there's, there's a group in Germany that uh, works on protein <coughs> docking, that is, uh, and they are developing this method are using non-local equations that uh, they use to, to, to for some numerical analysis, some, 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 some computer programming uh, that aids in the design of pharmaceutical drugs. So this is a very real, this is a very concrete real world application of uh, interdifferential equations. So there is a, um, in image processing, there is this, this papers of Gilboa and Osher, there's also a paper by Guidotti, that they use uh, non-local equations for denoising. Um, there, is this, uh, th there are many equations from fluids that use uh, interdifferential diffusion. Um, the most famous one maybe is uh, SP, the surface quasi-geotrophic equation with fractional diffusion. So if you take the, so the, if you take this surface quasi-geotrophic equation with the diffusion that is Laplacian to one half, there is some physical application of that, uh, physical motivation of the equation. I don't quite understand it. Um, for but people study like all sorts of fractional diffusion, even if it's not necessarily physical. 
Um, it's more, most, mostly like a toy model for more complicated equations in fluid mechanics. The surface concentrotrophic equation without diffusion is a two-dimensional model that resembles in many ways the behaviors of the three-dimensional Euler equation. If you want a two-dimensional model that mimics the difficulties of 3D navier stocks, you would take the SQG and add diffusion to it. But if you add full diffusion, if you add the full Laplacian, you get a subcritical equation <coughs> that is very easy to show that is well posed. So in order to have a good analog of uh, 3D navier stokes but it's an easier equation in 2D, you would take the SQG equation and add fractional diffusion of order of uh, the power of the Laplacian less than one half. So that's also uh, like a supercritical diffusion. And it seems to have similar features as 3D navier stokes That's what people study that. Um, so there are actually many other toy models, but this is like the most famous one. Uh, so I already mentioned that the Boltzmann equation is some place where you can uh, apply into differential equations. This is, a, this is already from the beginning. It's an equation that models the evolution of uh, the particle distribution at, in, at, with respect to space and velocity of dilute gases. Um, the equation from the beginning is an integral differential equation, but it doesn't have the form of the equations that I was describing. It has a, a different form. So you have to work a little bit if you want to take it, if you want to apply the type of results that I was mentioning to the Boltzmann equation. Um, there is a conformal geometry. There are this, uh, um, the work of Alex Chang and Mark Gonzalez that they, they create this uh, conformal invariant uh, operators of fractional order that are no local operators. And there is a recent paper by uh, Nestor Guillén and Russell Schwab that I also wanted to mention, which is interesting because they solve a problem for a classical second order equation using integral differential equations. So what they do is they take a homogenization, they, they take a, a second order elliptic equation, and they take oscillating Neumann condition. And then they study the homogenization of this equation, and in order to, to prove the result, they use integral differential equations. And essentially the reason why their method makes sense is because if you take the Dirichlet to Neumann map for an elliptic equation, you get an integral differential equation of order one. So they use results for integral differential equations to study homogenization on the boundary for the Neumann so, uh, boundary condition of a second order equation. <coughs> All right, so if we take the, the Helder estimates, the, the, the results that I was mentioning, uh, the first canonical application of those results is for the Isaacs equation. The Isaacs equation is an equation that comes from the study of the optimal strategy in a zero-sum game, uh, in a zero-sum stochastic game. So this is like we have a Levy process, a purely charged Levy process, but there are some parameters that we can adjust <coughs> that, it, that, that uh, modify the way in which the process jumps. Right? And we are following the process, and after some period of time, we're going to get a payoff function depending on where the process ends. And one player modifies one parameter, the other player controls the other parameter. One of the players wants to maximize the expected value of the payoff, the other one wants to minimize the expected value of the payoff. If you study the optimal strategy of this, of this game, of this stochastic game, you, you get that the value function for this optimal strategy satisfies an equation like this, that is the Isaacs equation. So the Helder estimates that I was mentioning imply that solutions of an equation like this are C1 alpha, meaning that the first derivative is Helder continuous. Um, in fact, it's a, it's a fairly quick application because you can show that if you have a solution of an equation like this, the, the derivatives satisfy the assumptions of the theorem for the Helder estimates. Um, let me make a few remarks. Here you see that the operator that I have here is a nonlinear operator because I have this sup and this inf. And, but it's translation invariant. If you, you know, all these cameras depend on y only, they don't depend on x. However, for every different point x, I'm going to end up picking different values of a and b, so I'm going to be picking different cameras at every point. And a priori, I don't know if this choice has any sort of regularity. So, if, you, if I think that what this is a, as a if, I, if I think of what, the, what effective choice of cameras I'm getting, 
I can write this as like k of x comma y, but I cannot assume any regularity with respect to x a priori. Uh, in fact, what, what, we, what we, we need to do to get this result is to come up to study the linearization of this equation, which is exactly that, but here we would have the derivative of the, of the solution. And so what we end up with is, 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 is a kernel that changes from point to point, and it doesn't have any, regular, any regularity in the way it changes, because we don't know how this choice is made from one point to the next. That's why we can never assume any regularity of this choice of kernels if we want to apply it to a theorem like this. Um, so here, the assumption that we have to make on the kernel depend, depends on the assumption that we have in the Heller estimate. So if we, if the, the, for example, if we, one, one variation for which the theorem is true is, is, is for if, if for every A and B, the kernel is comparable with the kernel of the fraction of Laplace. <coughs> so another result is, is comes from a stochastic control problem that here I have only an infimum instead of an in soup, so I have only one uh, optimization, so only one parameter. It's, uh, the Bellman equation is a similar story. I have a stochastic control problem. It's, it's like a game of only one player that wants to minimize or maximize the expected value of the, po of the final payoff. Um, so that, that gives us an equation like this. Here I wrote the, the elliptic version of the equation. We have this result with, with Caffarelli that the solution, the, the, the solution of this equation are always classical. So this, this equation always has sol solutions that are sufficiently smooth to make, to make sense of this oper operator classical. Um, the result that we have is, is an inter a fractional order version of the result of Krilov and Safono, of, of Evans and Krilov, that says that if you have a fully nonlinear equation that's uniformly elliptic and convex, then the solutions are C to alpha, and therefore classical. What we have is an inter-differential version of this result of Evans and Krilov. This one is not a corollary of the Helder estimates. It actually requires quite a bit of work, but it does use the Helder estimate in the proof in an important way. Um, so other equations that have been considered are equations that are like nonlinear first order equations with fractional diffusion. Um, so the, the, most, the best known of this is the surface quasi geotropic equation, which is this toy model for the equation in fluids that I was mentioning before. Um, when we when we, you study this type of equations, the main difficulty is to understand the interplay between the first order term and the diffusion. So if S, this parameter S, is greater than 1 half, then the diffusion would be of order greater than 1. And in general, when you S is greater than one, is greater than one half, then the diffusion is going to have enough regularization power to overcome the first order term, and it's relatively easy to show that the solutions remain smooth for all time. Um, if S is strictly less than one half, you have the opposite thing: the first order part <laughs> is stronger than the diffusion, and the diffusion is not going to be able to regularize the solution. Uh, or it's not going to be able to compensate the first order, the first order the term. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the case of the first two equations, it's possible to show that you can have a, a, an initial condition that is smooth, and it becomes non-smooth non in finite time. For the third equation, for the surface with the equation, that's still an open problem for S strictly less than 1 half. For S equal to 1 half, any of these three <coughs> equations has smooth solutions. But in that case, both the first order term and the diffusion have the same order, and it's actually much harder to show that, um, that, we, have this, uh, that we have smooth solutions. And in the case S equal to 1 half is where the methods that I was mentioning enter. Because in, those, in, th in that case, the first step in order to show the regularity of the solution is to prove a Helder estimate that, that holds for equations with drift and fractional diffusion. Um, and uh, the, the type of methods used are uh, similar to the methods used for the theorems I mentioned before. Um, so then I, I, I wanted to mention that you can also apply these methods to the, these, 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 these results to the <coughs> space homogeneous Boltzmann equation. Um, 
the only one you can apply is really the, the one that is working progress with Russell Schwab. Um, so the, the bad thing about the, uh, talk, uh, mentioning anything about the Boltzmann equation that explaining what the Boltzmann equation is takes a long time, right? So I'm not going to try very hard about this. Uh, so Boltzmann equation is this thing when Q is this huge integral differential quantity that is quadratic, right? So this here, V star, V prime, V star prime, and so on, comes uh, uh, are some points that depend on the two variables of integration. Uh, so as you can see, whatever this thing is, it certainly doesn't have the form of the interdifferential equations that I was showing you before. Um, so <coughs> well, there are, there are some, the, the, the function b, there are, there are some, some, some forms of this function that are the ones that are most relevant for the physical models. Um, and there are two assumptions that are sometimes made that simplify the model dramatically. One is to say that f is independent of x. So here the function f represents a distribution of particles at each point in space and each velocity. And so if we assume that this, this distribution of particles is independent of x, uh, that remains uh, with the, for, for positive time. And it simplifies the equation dramatically because it drops the, 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 the drift term, and it gives us a much simpler equation to study. Um, the other, another s s common assumption is to take the Graz cutoff assumption, that is to take the, f the, the cross section be integrable. Here I said before that the typical cross sections are like this, that are non integral with respect to theta. This is an assumption that departs from the physical models, but in some way it makes the analysis easier. It makes the analysis easier, but however, it makes uh, the regularization impossible. If you make this assumption, the Boltzmann equation is never going to regularize the initial data. So it's not an assumption that I would be interested in making. Uh, so I certainly don't want to make this assumption. But I, this assumption helped me very much to study the model. So if we start with the right-hand side of the, equation, of the equation that has this, this complicated quadratic form, you have to like play a little bit, add and subtract the term, <coughs> then take uh, like reorganize uh, the things a little bit, and then you end up with these two terms. The first one is an average of incremental quotients times that. That is what, what, is what I'm going to consider my kernel k. The second one is actually a lower order term. So you can write this as an integral differential operator, exactly like the ones I was writing, where, with, where, where the kernel k depends on f, on the solution itself plus a lower order term. So <coughs> here k depends on the solution itself. So for different solutions, I'm going to have different kernels. So how do I check the hypothesis of my kernel if I don't know what the solution is? So the point is that um, the, this kernel k, with, uh, if I want to check the assumptions of the theories that I had, that, that, I, that I presented that is in preparation with Russell Schwab, is only going to depend on the macroscopic quantities associated with F. So it's going to depend only on the energy, of the, on the mass, and on the entropy. And those are things that are very well controlled just from the initial, initial data. So I, here I wrote how K depends on F, it's a big formula, and somehow you can show that the assumptions of that theorem depend only on these macroscopic quantities, so you can really apply the theorem and whatever, so you get um, Helder estimates and a lower bound for the solution of the space homogeneous Boltzmann. So this is something that depends on a work on preparation, so it's going to be a con consequence of the, of the theorem that I have in preparation. And let me mention that space homogeneous Boltzmann equation is a fairly well understood equation, actually. For a good class of, of cross-sections, it's well known that if the solution, if, if the, the solution if the initial data, even if the initial data is not smooth, it's gonna, it's, it has some regularization effect. The lower bound, I believe, is new. Um, but in any case, the methods to show the regularization for Boltzmann equation are so different from this that I think it's still worth studying this. So I'm going to finish. Let's just start the process with some incentive to the committee.
and then we'll Do you have any question? Okay. I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, it's, it's new to me, this idea of the Boltzmann application. Right. Is there a way that you can make like interpolation from Boltzmann to fractional with turbulence? Is there what? a way? I mean, you are doing uh, operators with turbulence. Yeah. One of the ideas is doing operators that look like fractional operators. Mm -hmm. This idea is a different kernel operator. Is there a way of interpolating? I mean, because Boltzmann is another level in physics of uh, modeling uh, particle interaction. Yeah. And uh, diffusion is a, the higher level, the more right. microscopic. Yeah. Is there a way of going in the middle? Well, I don't know. Because the microscopic with particles is a mess of an equation, right? Yeah. So I don't know what I would interpolate. But it looks like uh, there could be a way of, uh, of looking if a unified theory for both things. Right? Well, <laughs> it's uh, very ambitious to say that, right? Even yeah. like uh, justifying the equation so is already a very big problem. So interpolating should, should be very difficult as something to hope for. Okay. <coughs> Please. Um, can you put traffic? For gain more and more regularity. For what? For Boltzmann. I don't know. I mean, in the in the in the I, I mentioned that this is an equation that, for with other methods, they get C infinity regularity actually, mm -hmm. and the the way they do it, of course, they bootstrap it. Right. So, uh, but they use different methods, and the the way using this method, I get I get I get the problem with the localization of my of my estimates. So I don't really know. I'm pretty sure I can get up to C one alpha. But I don't. I need to work a little more if I to make to get higher regularity than that. Other method to get C infinity. Really the other hard. method you to get C yeah, infinity. Yeah, yeah. but uh, that require uh, initial data to be H five or something. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, and uh, you don't seem to require that. Well, no, no. Yeah, so like, also that, that has an advantage in that. Yeah. But yeah, like, like I said, this is something that is very much in progress. <laughs> yeah. But so far, I mean, if I just apply the result that I have, I get some basic regularity like C1 alpha. I get C alpha for sure. I think I can also get C1 alpha. And I need to work a little more to see if I can push it harder to higher regularity. If you succeed, you'll be stronger without than other results. I don't know. I don't. I, I'm not aiming at stronger. I'm aiming at different at the moment, right? It's a completely different approach. So I, I believe it's gonna. It's, it's not gonna. It, it doesn't give exactly the same thing. It gives something else because the approaches are so different. That uh, also the, the the assumptions on the on the cross sections uh, that don't match exactly. It's a slightly <laughs> different assumptions. Any more questions? So, if not, let's uh, thank our speakers. <laughs> thank everybody for coming.